Welcome to Sewing with Threads, the monthly podcast by the staff of Threads Magazine. I'm your host, Threads Editor Sarah McFarland, and I'm joined by Threads staff members. I'm Carol Frazier, the Senior Technical Editor. I'm Janine Clegg, the Senior Copy Production Editor. And our special guest today is Gail Patrice Yellen. Thank you for inviting me. This is exciting, my first podcast. Oh, welcome, welcome. Gail. Good to have you here. Have you here. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Gail is the author of several books, including one on embellishing garments, and she's written frequently for threads. She's developed a line of skirt and jacket patterns that provide opportunity for embellishment. She's also a serger expert and teaches classes and workshops about serging and embellishing techniques. Gail's the owner of Gail Patrice Design and is an active member of the American Sewing Guild. You can read her blog, take one of her online classes, and find out more about her at gailpatrice.com. Okay, it's time for five speedy sewing questions. And today it's Gail Patrice Yellen in the hot seat. Okay, Gail, who taught you to sew? Well, I think I'm basically self-taught. My mom taught me how to do a dart and install a zipper. But I I say I was self-taught, but after I took my very first sewing class at a local store, I realized I didn't know how to sew. So... (laughs) I had sewn for about 20 years and thought I knew what I was doing until I started taking the class. So I would have to say classes at a local store really did teach me. Oh, sure. And what's your favorite sewing term? I thought about this, and it's really a phrase. I I couldn't come up with one word, but I love the phrase turn of cloth. I think there's something very elegant about it. And um, when I learned what it meant... I thought it was such a perfect phrase for what it means. Yes, it's a, it's an important concept. Yeah. It is an important concept. And a nice turn of phrase, too. Yeah. Good one. What are you currently sewing? Well, I'm actually working on a new line of patterns for an online subscription service that I'm going to be launching with one of my very best sewing friends, uh, Jennifer Stern Hosman. And it's called Stitching Zen with Gail and Jen. And we'll have our Zen collection of um, patterns. So that's what we're working on right now. Fun. That sounds sounds interesting. Yeah. Yeah. What's your favorite fabric to sew? You know, I, I love the natural fibers. I love wool. I love linen. But there are so many amazing knits on the market now that I've really gone into loving them. And I love them not only to sew, but also to wear. And because I travel so much, it's wonderful to have all of these great knits that are available now. And what do you love most about sewing? I like the duality of it. I like the fact that I can be in my sewing studio by myself and going through a process. And I find that just meditative and therapeutic. But I also like the fact that it's given me a tremendous opportunity to have a community. And um, it's because I've taught on Craftsy, I have people from all over the world who ask questions, but it's wonderful when I travel across the country and I see people. It's like a big reunion every time, which is, it's the best of both worlds. Well, thank you, Gail. You're welcome. We're talking today to Gail Patrice Yellen, and our topic with Gail is embellishments, when, where, and how to use them. Uh, I think that sparkly extras have been a thing for some time now on fashion runways, and they may be a little over the top or everyday wear, except on fashion conscious tweens. Gail, let's talk about how to embellish garments without looking like a Disney princess. What's wrong with the Disney princess? <laughs> <laughs> it's very in now. Well, Disney queen. Yeah, 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 Disney yeah, queen. yeah. especially with, uh, with the under eight-year-olds, I guess. Yep. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, actually, I have a lecture that I do sometimes with my trunk show um, for different programs. And it's called, I know how to do it, but where do I put it? And it's really uh, just kind of a fun lecture. And uh, I just did it out in the Sacramento area earlier this summer. And um, it's just kind of a fun thing because The way I got the name of the lecture was uh, when a woman came into a sewing store that I worked in just very part-time, and she was purchasing her first machine that did uh, embroidery. 
she had this very puzzled look on her face when she came up to the point of sale and we were taking care of the paperwork. And I just I said to her, well, is there something that I didn't go over that you want me to review? And she said, no, no, I think I can get myself going. And um, I said, well, is there a question I can answer? And she said, well, um, how do I know where to put them? And it's a perfect question because that is a big issue with embellishments mm-hmm. that a lot of times people can be very good at embellishing ideas, but they're not sure on placement. And my suggestion for her, now this is pre-Pinterest when you could have the um, virtual scrapbooks, but I said to her to get a three ring binder and um, plastic page protectors. And I said, whenever you see something that you find pleasing as far as composition goes of a print or beading or any kind of embellishment, I said, rip out the page and put it in. And I said, it doesn't have to necessarily be a garment. Even home deck gives you a lot of ideas and um, jewelry, shoes, sandals have lots of different ideas on them. And I said, that will give you an idea of um, pleasing placement on different things, but it is uh, a big deal. And knowing when to say when is probably my favorite thing to tell people is that you can always add more, but sometimes you can't necessarily <laughs> remove things. And, um, if you go too far overboard, it kind of makes a visual mishmash and people can't really appreciate if things that are done very, very well, if there's too much visual overload on something. Do you think that people tend to put too much on or too little on when they're unconfident? Um, I think I think people tend to sometimes go a little bit overboard. Um, and I'll always say to people, if you're not sure of placement, and, and I fall into this category too, sometimes I'm not too sure about where I want to put something. And my best advice for that is to put it on either, if you don't have a dress form, then put it on a hanger and let it sit for a day or two and don't look at it and then go back. And sometimes I'll pin something on or just place it temporarily and I'll go back and I'll say, ooh, no, no, that should be a little lower, higher, or maybe I shouldn't have it there at all. And But I think sometimes when you let something sit and not look at it for a day or two, it's just a good way to get fresh eyes on it and realize. And asking somebody who has a good sense of composition too is also very helpful because a lot of times they're looking at it for the very first time and they don't have any idea of what your original vision was for something. So it, that can be helpful as well. That's actually a very good idea for doing any kind of design like this to, mm-hmm. to incubate it for a little bit and then go back and see how it looks. Um, what about proportion? Do you consider the proportion of the embellishment feature um, according to how it looks on the garment or do you think about what it's going to do for you on your person or, or what? All of those things. Um, a lot of times I think one of the first things to take into account is the fabric that you're working with and mm-hmm. can the fabric support the embellishment technique. And um, also the type of garment, if it's something that you're going to be wearing on a frequent basis and either laundering it or having it dry cleaned, or is it a special occasion garment, maybe a mother of the bride outfit that you're making that's very special that maybe you'll wear once or twice more, but probably not after that. The delicacy of Mm -hmm. something is, and wearability and, and something that will stand the test of time with stress and um, just everyday wearing makes a big difference on that. And also um, for people who are still in the working world, um, safety is something too to think about that. um, Are you putting something on the sleeve that could could get caught in machinery or other Mm -hmm. things and or sometimes even for teachers who teach preschool or young children and they love to pick at things and or somebody in a daycare center with a baby that has babies in it and babies love to pull on things and Mm -hmm. so things like that are all things that I like to think about and just mention as things to keep in mind. So you yeah. do you usually start with the fabric, Gail, or do you have sort of this notebook of embellishment ideas and you look for opportunities to use them? 
Um, both. Sometimes if I think up a new embellishment idea and I'm not sure if I've never tried it before and I'm not sure if it's going to work, I'll go for um, a solid fabric that is a blank slate and um, work on it. And um, But it just depends on the fabric and how it speaks to me. There are some uh, print fabrics that really don't need a lot of embellishment. They they mm -hmm. make a statement all by themselves, and mm -hmm. I don't need to make any improvements on them at all. <laughs> and um, so sometimes even just a fun closure on something like that that enhances it and complements it, but doesn't overwhelm it, and um, it just is a nice finishing touch on something. And that that can be whether it's home deck or garment construction. But I'm mainly a garment so or so. That's the way I think. Now, I feel you're very creative and inventive with your embellishment techniques. Uh, you, you, you wrote a book about them. I did. And I wondered, what was the first technique that you really felt was yours, was something that you came up with? Oh, that's an easy one. It's my windows technique. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is kind of an interesting story. My husband went to Pratt Institute, which is a, an art and architecture and design school in New York. And I had this idea one night, and I don't know about you, but sometimes you have these moments of brilliance right before you go to sleep at night <laughs> or when you first wake up in the morning. And all of a sudden, I had this idea for holes in fabric. Mm -hmm. And so I jumped out of bed, and um, sometimes I'll have these moments where I'll, I think I'll remember in the morning, and I don't, and then I'm mad at myself for not writing them down. So I jumped out of bed, and I drew a picture, and it looked fabulous on paper, and I couldn't wait to get up in the morning and actually try it out. And the way I had originally um, configured the construction of it was uh, pulling uh, a fusible interfacing or a fabric to the right side of the garment. And I did it on some scrap fabric and I was totally dejected by about four <laughs> o'clock in the <laughs> afternoon. And um, my husband came home from work and because he went to a design school, um, he, he came home and he said, well, what's wrong? And I said, oh, this idea that I thought was going to be so fabulous looks, it, it, all I could think of was it looked like the fabric was wounded and had Band-Aids all over it. <laughs> <laughs> and he gave me a very, very good piece of advice. And he said, well, if you really like the idea, rethink it and rework it and figure out a different way to do it. And that was exactly what I did. I said, well, maybe I should be pulling the fabric to the wrong side of the garment. And it worked. And I just love the technique because it was um, a way to do a lot of different things with the windows and to bead them and just do a lot of different fun techniques with it. And I think I did a windows you, technique yes, for you did a previous yeah. threads. Yes. Yeah, yes. but that was really the first one that I did. That was my idea, and I, just, I still love it. I think it's fun. You just have to be careful where you put those windows when you're in the <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. yes, I think you did uh, the windows for us, and we can put that in the show notes for this episode. And you also did the the reweaving technique. Oh, my the unbeweavable. Beads. Unbeweavable, yeah. yes. Yes, yeah. Um, and I can remember the first time I had a garment in um, a style show at an expo, and the woman who was doing the commentary, I had wrote in that it was my unbeweavable technique. And I think she kind of looked at her notes and was like, the what? <laughs> 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 and um, But I do, I call it the unbeweavable. And there are two different ways of doing it with the woven fabrics. It's really kind of an updated version of drawn threads. But then when you use it with um, knit fabrics, you can use a little... A rotary cutter called the Edge Perfect Blade that has teeth on it that creates perforations. And um, it's really kind of fun to do it. it. It's much faster on knits. Let me just say that. That's oh, a that's fun enhancement because I don't think we covered that at the when you did the article at that time. I don't know if you were doing that on knits yet. Um, if I did, I... Um, I don't think I used knits uh, in that article, but I actually have a garment with me that is fun on polar fleece, believe it or not. Oh, oh we'll, talk, yeah. we'll talk more yeah. about yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's kind of fun, but um, I was really kind of proud of myself for coming up with the word unbeweavable. <laughs> yes, that's great. <laughs> well, and it's good for people who can't pronounce uh, uh, L's. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. 
What is probably the most time you've spent on particular garments embellishments? Oh, <laughs> I have a black jacket and it was a second one and it was a, um, I think there's a linen cotton blend and um, I did the unbelievable technique and I used a lot of Swarovski sew on crystals with it. And it was really very pretty. But my original idea for that was that I was going to use a wool... A crepe? Yes, uh, it was a wool oh, okay. crepe, yes. Good guess. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sarah, yes. <laughs> Every a brain freeze. But I was going to use a, a wool crepe, and um, I had done a test sample on maybe a 12-inch square of fabric, and it worked fine. But then when I was pulling longer pieces of the fibers out of the weave the thread kept breaking and it was black and I kept using, I used a light box so I could see what I was doing. And I know for a fact, and don't ask me why I timed it, but I spent 19 hours trying to make it work on this thing. And you know how they say the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over (laughs) Over and and over. Expecting different results. Yes, exactly. (laughs) And finally I was like, hmm, maybe it's time to, change change fabric so I went and got this linen cotton and it was a much happier faster result with that but um I know that was that took quite a while to do and the beading on it and all of that and there's another jacket that is actually on the cover of my counterpoints jacket that was a a beautiful teal linen that was the very first one that I did that technique on so and that was very time consuming mostly because of putting beads on a ribbon so, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Have you found you've gotten faster with techniques as you go along? I have only because I've done them so many times. And it's, again, when I travel and I have things in a trunk show and people look and they go, oh, you know, they look so perfect. And I say, well, you're not seeing the first time I did something. You're <laughs> seeing the 150th time I've done it. So um, I said, you just have to kind of practice, but you do get much faster. But there are some things that are very time consuming, like hand beading can be time consuming. Mm-hmm. But even with that, I've gotten faster, I think, because I've gotten a little more confident about it. Do you have any tips for easier visibility for people like uh, in my age group where it's harder for us to see things than it used to be? Mm -hmm. Good task lighting, definitely. Um, And I like um, the uh, lights that give you, they're easy on the eye, Mm -hmm. but, and sometimes there are little headlamps too that people Mm -hmm. like to use. Um, I never do that kind of work in a car only because if you come to a screeching halt, the beads are all over the car and never to be found again. So, because it would be a great, great thing to, and I've often thought I'll do it on a plane when I'm traveling someplace, but I never do because I'm always afraid that if we hit turbulence, it would be the same result. I have had to bead a dress on a train Mm -hmm. before, before a photo shoot. Uh, It it went okay, but it was a lot slower on the train. Yes. Yes. You don't accomplish quite as much as you think (laughs) you will. So, uh, but yeah, now you talked works. about a lot about embellishment techniques that do take time. Do you have an embellishment technique that you have tried and done successfully that uh, is a little faster for those people who don't have a lot of time but want to embellish their garments? Yes, and um, I love using my thread palette on my serger with the cover stitch. And um, it's just a little thread stand that has four pegs on it, and you can use multiple threads going through the loopers. And most of the time I'll use it with the chain looper in the cover stitch mode. But if I wanted to use two decorative threads in my upper looper, two in my lower looper, it's nice to do. Um, Usually if I'm going to use four threads, I'd use a machine embroidery weight thread. Um, You don't want to overstress your machine. And, but sometimes um, I'll use a bolder thread and maybe cut down to three with um, a heavier, maybe a 12 weight thread and then two machine embroidery weight threads. And that's very quick because all you're doing is stitching and it's beautiful. And you're doing it with the right side against the feed dog so that Mm -hmm. that chain looper side shows on the face of the garment. I think we did that in your recent article where we had the bracelets Yes. yes. The belt loop binder yes. article. Yes. And it creates, well, I think you use some variegated threads, but it creates this beautiful blended thread embroidery effect. Exactly. Yeah. And the variegated threads are very pretty on their own, but you get more of a block-like 
um, change in the colors when you mm -hmm. use a single one. But this blends, and as the threads twist going through the machine, different colors come to the forefront along a long stitching line, which I think is really beautiful, and it's pretty. Yes, yeah. so I, I forgot that we had the bracelets in that article, and that was so sense, pretty. Yeah. I love the way that came out in the photographs. I have an organizing question. Mm -hmm. For I'm sure you have many, many beads and buttons and different threads. How, you have any tips for storing them? How do you store your materials? Um, badly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, actually, my beads and buttons, I do have um, those little um, bead containers that you can get in the craft stores. And those are great because everything stays secure and they're screwed together. And they're usually in kind of a column where you build them up. But And I have... For my buttons, I do have a tabletop cabinet with a bunch of different drawers, and uh, I purchased years ago um, a big collection of buttons at a historical society auction in town. And um, a couple of weeks after, I should say, actually, my husband did, I had to teach a class the day of the auction. And so I just asked him if he would go and keep bidding till. I got it. <laughs> and he's a good guy, so he did that. But anyway, um, a couple of weeks after the auction, I broke my leg and doing some gardening, and, well, which is why sewing, I think, is much safer. But um, I uh, had the time to sit and do something that took some time, and I separated out all the old buttons and kind of separated them by colors and types of buttons and cleaned them and got all the old yucky thread out from them. And old, old buttons can be very dirty. <laughs> so, um, and I didn't. I organized them, and I think it was probably a good opportunity because it was a huge collection. And the, it's kind of one of those things, like sometimes the longer you look at something, the more overwhelming it looks. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of nice that that my leg broke two weeks after I had it. So I was still enthusiastic about it. Oh, what a great find. Where else do you look for uh, beads and buttons? What are some of your favorite sources? Well, um, whenever I travel, um, if I have the opportunity um, to go around different places, if, if, I'm at an ASG event, um, and they have somebody designated to kind of be my chauffeur, which is a very nice perk. Mm -hmm. um, I'll ask them if there are any bead shops around. And I try to buy beads when I go different places because then when I use them, I'll think, oh, I got that in Sarasota or I bought that in Charleston or I got that in Virginia. And it's just kind of a nice memory. And I can remember where I got different things. That's great. Yeah. Nice mementos. Yes, it is. This is Point and Counterpoint, and today's controversial topic is, is it okay to sew over pins? Everybody's silent. Everybody's silent. <laughs> They're all silent. I know. Everybody Nobody wants to admit that they do I it know. once in a while. Uh, I, I do sew over pins occasionally. I am very careful to pin perpendicular to the seam line. I remove most pins before I get there. But if I'm a hur in a hurry, it's a long seam. It's a you know, plain woven fabric. Uh, big stitches if I'm basting, you know, yeah. I just don't want that needle to every once in a while, it'll kind of squarely hit on the side of the pin, but the pins are round. So it usually slides to one side or the other. I just, um, I, most of the time I will say I do not sew over pins. However, occasionally I have been known to, but it's funny, this has not happened to me for years. Just the other day, I was sewing and I wanted to keep everything exactly as I had pinned it. And I was going around a corner and I whacked it with the needle. And I still haven't found the other half of the needle that went, <laughs> went flying someplace in my sewing studio. So it, it'll show up eventually. When I was growing up, I had an older sister and she learned to sew on the machine before I did, just a little bit before I did. And she, my mother said it was okay for her to sew over pins. And she was, she was impetuous. She would just go blazing along sewing over all these pins and we never had any problem with it. But at one point my mom said, it's not really the best idea. And of course I was a annoying, you know, kind of perfectionist kid. And I thought, well, I will never sew over a pin in that case. And so I really don't sew over pins except by accident, or if I'm going super slowly, almost hand cranking, you know, to get mm -hmm. from stitch to stitch, and I need to keep things really where they're lined up, so then I can be sure that I'm not going to hit a pin. But once in a while, and this happened to me recently, I had I had pinned um, 
parallel to the seam line in along one layer, and then I'd put another layer on top, and I hadn't gotten all the pins out. Mm -hmm. So I was sewing along, and I, I that pin got it. I didn't stitch it, but it went down into the bobbin area, and I didn't know what was going on, and I really had to do a little bit of disassembly to get that out. It was not my finest moment. But that's why you don't want to have pins when you're sewing. But it keeps it exciting, doesn't it? It sure does. <laughs> <laughs> I think I might have been making a sample for a photo shoot, and I was thinking, this is not that exciting for me to have a machine that's broken right now. <laughs> well, I think, I think we do, we have all sewn over pins at one point or another, whether by accident or deliberately. Um, and you know, I think of beginner sewers. Um, if you tell them don't sew over pins and then sometimes they have to stop to take the pins out as mm -hmm. opposed to sewing along and taking the pins out as you're sewing along. I think that comes with experience. It's easier to do. But when you're just starting out, sometimes you you need to stop to take, you know, do one thing at a time. And stopping and starting with your sewing can create jagged stitching mm -hmm. lines. And I think that's discouraging for beginners. However, I still always recommend that people take the pins out before they get to them. And I try to do that as well. Um, if you, uh, my suggestion, my recommendation is if you are, you have a particularly difficult area that you need to make sure stays exactly, exactly, exactly. If you have a lot of pins, like you were talking about before, Gail, why not baste it, hand baste it first and and then just and take the pins out and you you have it as you want it and you're not worried about the pins and your your fabric is not going to shift too much if you've basted it in place mm -hmm. by hand i mean a, <laughs> the machine basting then would defeat yep. that purpose of right. sewing over you know not sewing over pins but i think basting is a great thing and um, it helps you with your learning how to do some hand stitching i know not everybody likes to do hand stitching but um, it does come in handy for these Absolutely. types of things. Absolutely, yeah. And, you know, sometimes it's just a factor of time for me. If I have the time, I always baste in sleeve caps. Mm -hmm. I, yes. I like to mm -hmm. set a sleeve perfectly with some, um, you know, I'll use a hand um, back stitch, really get it in there. Then, of course, it takes me a while to get those stitches out afterwards, yeah. too. But I feel as though, I feel as though we're talking about... Um, you know, some kind of habit that, that people do, like drinking alcohol, but you, when people <laughs> start, uh, when they're old enough to consume alcohol, you have to give them a lot of rules and guidelines and they have to kind of grow into it and do it responsibly. So you may sometimes sew over a pin, please do it responsibly, mm -hmm. slowly, carefully. And never on your serger. Well, I was going to say, yeah, that's what I was going to say. Actually, when I, when I finally got a serger, I, I tried to use, I mean, I use very few pins when I'm working on a serger, partly because the differential feed keeps things a little bit more aligned, so mm -hmm. I don't have to try to match things as much. But also just because on the serger, I feel like I can really speed mm -hmm. and, and, and do it fairly accurately, but I don't like to have to worry about a pin getting, getting caught under there somehow because I know that's pretty fatal. So, Well, it can, yeah, it is. Um, of course, most of the time where it'll do the damage is on a knife and you can always change out that blade. But um, I just recently saw a question in an online group and a woman said she never used her serger to, to set in sleeves because mm -hmm. she was afraid of them shifting. And I'm a big hand baser. I'm the same way you are. I mm -hmm. want that sleeve cap to stay put and I want the shoulder um, to not to match up with my shoulder seam. And I always, always baste it in. And I said, there's no shame in basting it in. There's <laughs> no. nothing wrong with that. Right. And I do that. And I, I like hand sewing. So mm -hmm. I like to hand baste. I don't mind. Yeah. Maybe we should state why it's not good to sew over pins because the pin can get caught, can break the machine needle. Mm -hmm. It can get um, caught in under the bo in the bobbin area. Yeah. Um, it can really screw up the... Um, mechanics of the machine. Yes, mm -hmm. it can really right. uh, screw up your machine. And I've also, I have on occasion found that if the pin hits the feed dogs just right, it can catch the fabric or shift your seam allowance, create a little uh, jog there. Right. Yeah. And finally, I am always thinking about Kenneth King, who has a really interesting method of pin basting. I don't know if you've watched his videos close up, but if you do, you'll see that he pins on the seam line and uses a very long pin that he weaves in and out like a, like a hand basting stitch, only they're pins. 
And the way he sets it up is so that the heads of the pins are toward him as he's sewing. And as the fabric moves over the feed dogs and toward the, toward the needle, the pins kind of automatically want to slide away and the fabric is kind of pulled off the pins. So it's, it's very counterintuitive. It's exactly the, the thing that I would probably tell people don't ever do, but it works great for him. He just kind of puts one finger on the top of the head of the pin. It just kind of walks away from the pin and then he throws the pin over to the side onto, a, I guess, a pin cushion or something and, and it seems to work. But that's for professionals on indoor tracks, I think. I'm not sure. <laughs> Beginners want to do it. Right. Well, you said, Sarah, that you pin perpendicular to the seam allowance. I do I the do. same because I think mm-hmm. it's easier to pull the pins out as you're sewing. Other people do pin parallel mm-hmm. to the, as you just described, that Kenneth does. Mm-hmm. So you just yeah. have to find what works for you. Yeah. And if you feel like you need to keep the pin in as you're sewing, what about what about pinning a little farther away from where the needle is going to come down? What's wrong with that? You know, There's nothing wrong yeah. with that. Yeah. 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 No. Okay, a couple solutions we've come up with. (laughs) (laughs) That's right. If you'd like to suggest a topic for Point and Counterpoint, leave a comment on the show notes for this episode at threadsmagazine.com. Now it's time for Q&A. Here's this episode's question. Which side of a faced garment section should you interface? For example, on a shirt collar, should you interface the upper or under collar? What about when making shirt cuffs? Do you interface the cuff or the cuff facing? Well, we were talking a little bit about this question when we were preparing for the episode. And it, for me, it depends. Mm-hmm. If it is a garment section that I want to be kind of smooth and structured, say a shirt cuff, I will sometimes put that interfaced side to the garment, uh, to the public side, to the, to the exterior. But then on a collar, I usually put it on the under collar because I want that smooth flow of fabric on the, you know, to flow over the upper collar and the turn of cloth. Yeah. How about you, Gail? Um, I agree with that. I think it really depends on the garment itself and the look that you're trying to achieve for the mm-hmm. final um, finished appearance of the garment. So it can go either way. I think that patterns typically have you interface the part that's going to be the so-called public side. Mm-hmm. And that's generally can work in a, any kind of basic thing. But it's important to realize that whatever fabric you're using or what you're trying to make may ask you to do something different. It's a good idea to have an open mind about it. If you're doing something that's very lightweight, you may want to interface both layers. Maybe you want to change and use different weights of interfacing in the upper and under collar or the cuffs in some way. And it's worth maybe making some test samples with your fabrics and see how they behave together so that you can get the right fold and curl or whatever whatever your garment section is supposed to be doing, wrapping around you somehow or, or folding over somehow. Um, how about you, Janine? Do you have strict rules or? Uh, no, I don't. But I keep... Uh reminding myself of a roll collar that my grandmother had done for a jacket that that my sister was going to wear years and years ago. And this was before there were a lot of choices for interfacing. Mm -hmm. And she was not used to working with fusible interfacing. This was a wool jacket. And I remember that she had tried the fusible interfacing, which was very unlike her uh, to experiment with things. She always went with what she knew. And um, she must have... um, done it on the underside because I remember that roll collar never sat flat. Mm-hmm. And um, I don't think my sister ever wore that because it was, it was, it just looked wrong. And that was terrible for my grandmother because she was such a perfectionist oh, and yeah. I'm sure she felt terrible about it, but that was a lesson in choosing the right interfacing, first of all, and then deciding what side to put it, put it on. And, um, so yes, I think it does make a difference. Um, I prefer for crisper fabrics, especially I'm thinking of men's dress shirts, to have it on the outside, mm-hmm. um, even the collar. Um, but um, that wool jacket, I think it also had to do with the turn of cloth. I think she didn't take that into account because that wool was rather heavy. Yeah, um, and maybe it just didn't work the way she was used to because she had a fusible on one of the layers. Right. I know exactly. my mom didn't like fusibles either. She never right. used them. She was a sort of old school and did everything by hand and yes. used that, that old sew-in pellon. 
it was really stiff. Yes. And it was kind of an awful material in a way, but she kind of understood how it worked. And because it was sewn in and not fused on, she had a little bit more control over how, how that would work. So, you know, in something like a jacket, there was a little bit of an easier way to kind of make the turn of cloth work properly. Is there any concern with how a garment is going to wear over time if you use fusible on the public side. <laughs> well, right. some, some bad experiences from my youth are coming back to I, me during this conversation. I still have those. And I, I mean, I have a few things where I fuse the outer collar and I'm sorry I did because it over time it's gotten a little bit bubbly. It didn't seem like it was going oh. to when I did it. And it's too bad because that's the thing that's not so great. Sometimes when you iron it, you can make it go back to the way that you want it to look. But I... It, uh, when I look at them, I wish I had fused the under collar instead. I think um, that the adhesives that they use have mm-hmm. gone miles ahead of what they used to because I can remember the old ones and how they'd bubble and yeah. they just weren't as good a product as they are now. They've they've just improved that so much over the years that um, the results are usually better and they usually do tend to stay better through laundering and all of the other cleaning processes. Yeah, and not just the adhesives, but the interfacing fabric itself yes. is can be so light and fine that you almost don't know it's there, and mm. it just gives that extra little bit of body that you want. Again, it's really a good idea to sort of get your hands on some of these things and try them out and see what works really well for your garment. Well, I feel like this is getting a little far afield of it, but what's wrong with using sew and interfacing? I mean, I, I'm wondering, or even, you know, I, I again, go back to my grandmother. She used to just take an old cotton sheet that, you know, had worn out and use that as the interfacing instead of going and buying uh, fusible. I do like that, though. When I make collars, sometimes I like it because it's softer. If I want that look, then a a nice sort of lighter piece of woven fabric makes a nice interfacing. I agree. And for plackets and things. You were talking about plackets, Sarah, how you like to... I, w- I was. I, I like to put the um, interfacing on the private side mm-hmm. uh, for a button placket. I just like having that nice flow of the fabric. But Janine, I am so. I grew up with fusible interfacings. <laughs> I, maybe it's a, 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 a generational thing between um, your grandmother's time and my time. I I love them, um, and there are such wonderful varieties available today. And I feel like you can really get exactly the weight and the shade and the uh, um, amount of fusibility that you want. Yeah. And the more experience you have with them, the more you can feel like, you know, sometimes you cut out a pattern piece and there you are looking at it and thinking, okay, the next step with this is going to be, I have to fold it or press it or sew it or do something with it. How do I want it to act? And how can I make sure that it does that? And then the interfacing can help you make that come true. Whereas the fabric on its own might not. You just have to think about what kind of interfacing is going to either make it stiffer or just make it a little, you know, more well-behaved. It's interesting. This just dawned on me while we were talking about this, but um, in one of my online classes, people were asking questions about interfacing and knowing how much time to spend fusing it Mm. with the iron. And I was told that in uh, Europe, and I was told this by several people in the class, that when they purchase interfacing, it does not come with any manufacturer's instructions oh. on how long to fuse or at what temperature. And that's such a critical component of fusible interfacing to make sure you do that correctly to yeah. keep the garment looking good be- after it's been worn and washed and everything else. So that was that was rather surprising. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. I've actually had that too. I've bought some in places off a of bolt and it didn't have that plastic... Mm-hmm. She in it, in it that keeps it that tells you what to do with it. Um, as long as you know the brand, hopefully the manufacturer has some information online. Maybe I don't know how else you find out. I right? guess you have to test, test it, it as yeah. you said before. <laughs> Melt it a few times onto your fabric before you get it right. <laughs> so I'm wondering, um, depending on what side you decide to put the fusible interfacing, do you cut your pattern pieces larger or smaller um, for? a collar or cuffs, for example. Does that make a difference for you? Do you accommodate, you, do you make your seam, you know, make it a little, just a little larger? Oh, so that it will turn over? So yes, that it for will... the turn of cloth, yeah. If you, I mean, uh-huh. if you're, if you put it on the underside, then do you cut your outer, just your outer fabric larger? You know, your I, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm seeing two questions there. Yes, I know that's And a, one question I, is about um, cutting the pieces differently to accommodate t- 
turn of cloth. And I recently worked with a coat pattern and I really loved it because it did take into account the collar's turn of cloth and there were two separate pattern pieces. And Carol recently worked on a story mm -hmm. about, uh, it was Debbie Spence? Debbie Spence, Debbie yeah. Spence about turn of cloth and she shows how to stitch a collar so that you can accommodate turn of cloth. The other question might tie into, uh, I was thinking about this the other day, uh, whether or not you need to trim the seam allowances off of interfacing. Is that? Mm, yes, that's you, part okay. of it, right. As okay. I, all going through my mind as we were yes, talking about. Huh? I Trimming. have not bothered to do that for several years. I tend to use the, uh, um, for most projects, the lightest possible fusible interfacing that my project requires. Uh, I like to keep the hand of the fabric. Um, so I don't usually bother to trim the seam allowances out. But is anybody else uh, trim the seam allowances from their from fusible the inter from the fusible interfacing? I do. You because, do? Yes, because I don't. I, I feel like it's extra bulk in the seams, and I'm it not is. Sure I want that. Yeah. I think it, um, again, it it kind of depends on what I'm doing and mm -hmm. the look I want, and um, so depending on the garment. But most of the time, I'll use a, a lightweight um, interfacing that doesn't really give a lot of bulk in the, in the seam. So yeah. I I, it was definitely something to do when I used a stiffer sew in, in the olden days, then, mm -hmm. you know, you oh, sort of oh, sew yes. it into the yep. seam oh, allowance yes. and trim it really, really close. Yes. Cause you did not <laughs> want that in there. That's probably why I do trim because I was I so know. used to for <laughs> so long yeah. using sew in yeah. only. <laughs> it depends. I just haven't done anything in a, in a while that has had anything so heavy that I thought it would be a problem in the seam allowance, but I would take it out if it were going to be heavy for sure. Yes. Well, this has been a really interesting Q and A. Mm -hmm. Send us a sewing question at threadsqa at taunton.com and it could be answered in the magazine or during an episode of Sewing with Threads. Thank you for listening. Follow Threads on social media and visit threadsmagazine.com to view show notes for this episode. While you're on the site, check out Threads Insider, our online membership with exclusive access to expert sewing techniques. Until next time, keep on sewing with Threads. <laughs>